Based in Los Angeles, Gunjan Bagla is Managing Director of Amrit Inc., a California-based consulting firm focused on helping American companies succeed in India. His clients include Covidian, Roche Diagnostics, Beckton Dickinson, Johnson & Johnson, Gojo, Hollister, and many more. Gunjan spoke four times at the MD&M West Conference in Anaheim and was on the keynote panel at MedDevice San Diego and MDDI in Ahmedabad, India in years past. Gunjan has an MBA from Southern Illinois University and a mechanical engineering degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in India. He was also the president of the Alumni Association of the IITs. Based in the New Delhi area in India, Rajneesh Rohatgi spent over seven years building BD's medical surgical business in South Asia. Rajneesh has over 25 years of marketing, sales, and leadership experience in India and Africa in the healthcare, medical device, and consumer sectors. This includes a stint at VP of Marketing for Max Healthcare, a leading hospital chain in North India. Among his key accomplishments at BD was pioneering a customer-centric segmentation strategy followed by tight tactical execution to win against low-cost local competitors. At Max Healthcare, Rajneesh developed one of the first branding strategies for a healthcare provider in a market where the only brand had been the physicians themselves. Rajneesh has an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, which was established by MIT Sloan School, and a bachelor's in metallurgical engineering from IIT Kanpur. Gunjan and Rajneesh have written recent articles about India's medical device ecosystem for Med Device Insights, December issue, Med Device Online, a piece by Gunjan on how U.S. businesses can succeed in India in 2015 was recently published by the Harvard Business Review just before Christmas. Now here's Gunjan to kick off today's session. Thank you, Supriya, and welcome to everyone who has joined the webinar from the U.S., India, and elsewhere. Uh, we are going to go at a fairly rapid pace. I am speaking to you from uh, uh, beautiful Southern California, and uh, Rajneesh is joining in uh, from halfway across the world near New Delhi, India. Uh, so we'll try and make this work without any glitches. A few months ago, there was a news item that Chicago's uh, train system bought 400 automated uh, defibrillators. And this was a million dollar order placed on cardiac sciences. There's nothing particularly unusual about this kind of a purchase order, but the reason we bring you bring this to your attention is that the company Cardiac Sciences, although it started in America, is today owned by an Indian entity called OptoCircuits out of Bangalore. OptoCircuits has purchased a number of companies uh, across the U.S. in the med tech business, usually small to mid-sized entities, and they are building out uh, their, their global business out of their Bangalore headquarters. I bring this up as an example because I want you to understand that things are happening in the U.S.-India trade corridor that may be different from what you might expect normally. Let me take you to a more mundane example, uh, if you will. Uh, the largest medical device, independent medical device company in the world, Medtronic, uh, which is in the process of buying one of our clients, Covidian, in fact, uh, started this a program some time ago in the audiology market in August 2013. It's the pilot program that they are running in conjunction with a startup that has roots from MIT in, in the Boston area, and they've used a design firm from India, and they've partnered with a couple of hospitals, one in North India and one in the southern city of Hyderabad. The idea is to be able to improve the diagnosis and treatment of infections to the ear which are quite common in India and often go undiagnosed until they become really serious. So it's been an interesting effort. Medtronic is very active in India in a number of other uh, initiatives uh, which we won't really be discussing today, but we wanted to pick this one out to illustrate some of the kinds of ways in which med medical technology companies are engaging with the uh, Indian ecosystem. Just a little bit about us at Amrit. Uh, Amrit is a management consulting firm that helps U.S. and Western entities to be able to engage more deeply with India. 
one of our most vibrant practices is our medical device or medical technology practice. And the work that we have done uh, with the um, med tech practice has been covered in some of the publications listed here. And we have spoken at some of the conferences and events listed at the bottom of this slide. I'm not going to give you a sales pitch on Amrit in this, uh, in this particular presentation, but just wanted to give you some context that whatever material we are presenting is based on learning that we have acquired over the last 10 years working very closely with some very well-known med tech companies as well as some others that are much smaller and don't prefer to be mentioned. This presentation is broadly divided into two sections and we'll determine how much emphasis to give to each section. The first part is really talking about selling medical device technologies, products, and, and, and related services into India. And then we'll also, if need be, talk about leveraging India's engineers for products that are sold into Western markets or other markets. So this is a good time, I think, to try our first poll, if I can. So you should see on your screen an interactive poll. What is your primary interest in India? and choose the appropriate option for your business. And again, your responses are confidential, but it helps us, helps Rajneesh and I decide how much emphasis to give to each part of the webinar. And for those of you who have already cast your vote on this poll, I would encourage you, as Supriya said earlier, to send us any questions through the chat box. Uh, Supriya is tabulating them as we go, and uh, will interrupt us if need be to ask the question in the course of the webinar. Otherwise, we'll take some of them at the end. All right. Looks like most of you have voted. So let me close the poll and share the results. So most of you, uh, almost three-fourths of you, are interested primarily in selling medical devices. So we'll devote a good deal of attention there. And then towards the end, we'll talk about the second half in terms of using India's engineering skills. And we can also answer any questions about sourcing. Since a fairly small number of you are interested in sourcing, I would encourage, uh, encourage each of you who have that interest to send us questions so that we can be very focused on what we talk about. We've taken on a number of sourcing engagements for our medtech companies, clients in India and elsewhere, in fact, so we can address that as well. Right. Why, why is India interesting to medtech med companies? Well, many medical technology companies feel that they have established a good market for themselves in the United States, in North America, in Europe, perhaps in Japan and Australia. And now they are looking to reach the next 3 billion medical consumers. So when you are looking at a large market, the two countries that come into mind typically are India and China. And these are two very, very different countries. And we are going to talk about the nature of the Indian market. Some of the characteristics that differentiate India from, from the West and from other markets is that the wallet sizes are smaller. This means not only the wallet size of the patient spending the money, but also the doctors buying the equipment or making recommendations, sometimes the hospitals that, uh, that are engaged with the ecosystem as well. A related fact to keep in mind is that for many medical consumers in India, third party insurance is not a factor. So services are being paid out of pocket, including uh, stents and and, and uh, bypasses and so on. The other thing that I think many American companies don't fully appreciate is the impact of India's labor costs. India, Indian labor relative to the US is extremely low cost. And this means that the people working at the hospitals and clinics and across the ecosystem are perhaps not making as much money as we assume that the average uh, you know, nurse or technician or, or other repair person might make in the US. And so the economics of driving a product that's extremely reliable 
or the economics of how you repair and operate and maintain a piece of equipment becomes very different. You need to incorporate that even if you don't change your product design for India. You need to incorporate a deep understanding of how the product will be used in India. There are many instances of hospitals that will run their equipment six and seven days a week and as much as, uh, as, as 12 to 15 hours a day, whereas in the, in the US a CAT scan machine may sit idle for much of the time, you will find that the economics in India uh, drives uh, a higher degree of capacity utilization. And so you have to keep that in mind. The other thing you have to keep in mind beyond that is that in the US, uh, much of medical practice is dictated by the concerns of legal risk. You know, what could an attorney do to the hospital, to the, to the doctor, to the clinic in case something goes wrong? But you do have to be cognizant of, of product liability and malpractice in India. It's nowhere near the same level of risk that companies in the United States or even Europe have to deal with. So that, that's, that can actually factor favorably in your projections as you look at India. Now, for those who want to engage with India very deeply, we do talk about the idea of designing a product for India, and that can increase your sales dramatically. We'll get into that a little bit later. Rajneesh has a great example or two, and, and can also answer questions about that. So when you look at India, don't think of trying to duplicate what you did in China. Uh, this idea of India being a demand-side economy versus China being supply side is a great metaphor that my colleague Rajneesh came up with. And he illustrates it with the idea that you know India has lots of airlines, even though the airports weren't ready. Uh, they sold lots of cars even before the highways were ready. And this is going to continue, even though they are trying to build airports as fast as they can and highways as fast as they can. But the, the country continues to be overwhelmed. And the same thing is true in the healthcare ecosystem. So in order to be able to succeed in India, you have to take a proactive approach. If you want to have a runaway success in India, you can't simply wait for India to rise to the level of Western standards. Because if you do that, first of all, you'll have a fairly small market. And second of all, you leave yourself wide open to competition from unexpected sources. The best example of that from 2014 is from outside the medtech business. Uh, as Samsung and Apple were fighting for the mobile market in India. They were surprised to see first an Indian company called Micromax come up and uh, with a number of innovations uh, start eating into Samsung's and Nokia's market. And more recently, a Chinese company called Xiaomi has been tremendously successful because Apple and Samsung have not really moved as rapidly as the Indian consumer would have demanded. So there are live examples of this in every industry, and uh, we, we expect that you will see some of that in the, in the med tech business as well. There are some numbers on this slide. It's a busy slide. I won't dwell on each of the points. Just keep in mind, India is a big market. The economy is growing at about 6%, but healthcare is growing at 12 to 15%. Estimates of the current size of the med tech market are relatively moderate, about 4 to $5 billion. Uh, but foreign companies dominate that by value. So uh, out of that, a big chunk is being won in essentially by American companies. Private insurance is growing, but it's still in the single digits. And the government is slowly increasing its share of the spend. We expect a new budget from the finance minister uh, of the newly elected government in uh, February. Uh, the budget will uh, kick in starting April 1st, and we may there are signs that we may see a substantial increase to healthcare spending by the government. This will largely be in the area of the control of infectious diseases, which are a big problem in India. We don't worry about that very much in the US, but malaria, cholera, tuberculosis, and so on are significant. The Indian government is mildly concerned about lifestyle diseases. That's not their primary focus. That's largely left to the private sector when you look at diabetes and cardiovascular disease and so on, uh, because in some senses, these are the diseases of the rich or the middle class. And again, uh, Rajneesh may have a, a take on that in the Q&A. Give you a couple of examples of some companies that have entered India recently. Uh, and again, we won't read these slides to you. I think it's, uh, it's pretty clear. We, what we wanted to give you a sense was it's not just GE and Siemens and Medtronic and, and Smith and & Nephew. There are mid-range companies entering 
the Indian market. There are also many small companies that are choosing to make the leap and some who think that India will be a better market for them than other countries, including China, including Europe. So uh, there, there's a lot of activity of that kind going on. Um, I think this might be a good time to run one more poll. And as you're Let's running that, Sujan, I much. would like to um, encourage everyone to please send us your questions using the questions box in your webinar applet. This is a great time as the um, slides go on to send us any questions that you have, and uh, Gunjan and Rajneesh can take them. Thank you. Okay, so we want to we want you to tell us how much time you've spent in India on business since 2010. And the reason the question is framed this way is that if you have traveled as a tourist to India or if you have relatives in India or you went to India for a wedding, that doesn't really count because you don't get to see the world of business working in India. Our general assumption is that you don't begin to understand India seriously unless you have spent at least 30 days in the last five years in India. And if you haven't, then you, you are well advised to take serious guidance as you start to engage with India. And what I am finding with our audience today is that most of you have spent almost pretty much no time at all. 72% uh, have spent less than 10 days essentially. And uh, we've got about 10% that actually live in India who are on this, uh, on this uh, call. So uh, we have a, essentially a, a, an audience that is naive about India. Uh, there are a lot, lot of details we are glossing over for those of you who don't know India and feel free to send us questions at the usaatamrit.com address and we will uh, take them uh, offline. Uh, if you have something pressing, we can answer it uh, here live as well. Let, let me talk a little bit about regulation because this comes up as an issue when you want to sell Med, med, medical technology into India. So the, the structure of the law that regulates the sale of drugs, cosmetics, and medical devices was actually laid down in the 1930s in India and has been updated very mildly since. There is an active proposal for a major reform to this law and that reform would recognize devices as a separate category much more plainly. There are still some concerns that even with that law that the process won't be as uh, smooth and as predictable as you see in other countries. Uh, but nevertheless, that is where it stands. This new law has been in discussion really since 2005. And the previous government was supposed to introduce it and get it through parliament. Uh, but then they had other exigencies come up and never actually got it through. Uh, just last week, I saw that on the uh, website for the ministry that they have put up the, the new bill for comment. And uh, if all goes well, in the next session of parliament, which will be called the budget session, uh, this may actually come up. India has a bicameral system, so both the lower and the upper house have to approve it. Who knows what will happen, but if the current government wants it to go through, chances are that it will. But even when the law goes through, the regulations that govern the law will not actually, I know that define how the law operates, may not actually come through for another year. So for anybody on this call, if you're going to introduce a product, you have to assume that you're going to go with the current state. And the current state has applications and documents that are reasonably well defined on their websites, but to actually make the process work, you need to have an on-the-ground advisor in India who makes this happen. And our takeaway for you is that you're probably better off using an India specialist, whether it's Amrit or someone else is entirely up to you. But uh, going to a, a, a US-based company or a company that claims expertise in 20 countries might be doing yourself a disservice. Uh, so uh, make sure that whoever you work with understands India deeply and understands it well, uh, because many of the processes are not necessarily documented very well in the official public information. And it's not, there's not dark secrets about it, it's just that you may end up doing too much work or not enough work and delaying your application as a result. So this is something important that you should keep in mind. And, uh, and again, we can take more questions about this 
करने की एज एज वी मूव ऑन आई ऑल्सो वॉन्ट टू अलर्ट यू दैट इंडिया इज अ वेरी डाइवर्स मार्केट एंड शेयर वी हैव टू एक्सट्रीम्स पर हैप्स बींग रेप्रेजेंटेड टू अर्बन एक्सट्रीम्स वी वॉन्ट इवन टॉक अबाउट द रूरल हियर इन दिस प्रेजेंटेशन टूडे तो ऑन द लेफ्ट इज a picture of the first apollo hospital in chennai india in uh, in the southern state of chennai southern city of chennai i should say uh, this is india's largest corporate hospital chain and dr pratap reddy whom i had uh, the privilege to meet at the indian embassy about 6 uh, years ago uh, was the founder of this uh, of this chain he was a cardiologist practicing in the us and then returned to india at a time when uh, indian government wasn't wasn't really friendly to private business and has gone on to build 56 hospitals 10000 beds the government of india honored him with the highest second highest civilian honor and really the, the highest civilian honor is almost never given to business people so this is this is the highest level of recognition that any business person could receive uh we at amrit have visited many of apollo's hospitals we have taken our clients there and uh, uh, it's it's uh, quite impressive quite different in some ways that what you might see in the west they follow western practices and standards uh, but many of the things are different as well they've been featured in harvard business school case study they've been written about in many many western publications and at this point i'm going to hand the uh microphone to my colleague rajneesh to take the presentation through the next few slides thank you gunjan um morning to everyone uh just to take off from there in the very next slide um uh, between the two ends of the spectrum that gunjan just shared between apollo and the general government hospital on the other side there are a very wide variety of segments which are possible and there exist hospitals of all kinds and sizes uh so if i were to classify them as inpatient outpatient uh, categories within inpatient itself the private sector is a very large part of the infrastructure in india and accounts for almost 80% of the beds and within private sector there is the top end which is like apollo which gunjan spoke about which is characterized by being corporates uh they are listed on the stock exchange uh and they account for maybe 100 of the top end locations and comprise just about 5% of the beds uh they get almost 30 to 40% of the business from the sole phenomena of medical tourism where patients flying into india for a variety of uh, treatments and the rest is by from affluent indians and the insured segment but then under them are about 5 to 600 medium sized legacy hospitals which account for 15% of the beds and uh, these were the ones which were traditionally there run by charitable trusts uh, and run on a no profit basis and they are scrambling to improve their quality as the global class corporate hospitals have come in and raised the bar and but a very large aspect of infrastructure in india is the small single doctor owned nursing homes as they are called here uh, and they are comprised typically of 25 30 beds which is the limit of what one owner doctor manager can manage on his own and these account for 60% of the beds so it's, as you can see it's like extremely fragmented um for a variety of reasons uh paying capacity the number of patients in a particular radius around the hospital a limitation of uh, road transport facilities and so on which leads to this fragmentation and as a very large number of people as gunjan had said in one of the earlier slides that 50% of indians still don't access western style healthcare and that's where the market is increasing very rapidly and when they come in and start accessing western style healthcare these doctors start adding beds and start catering to their to these patients in the in the nearby areas and government accounts for 20% of the beds and again there's a spectrum of them ranging from the teaching research hospitals which are really very high end uh, good quality hospitals but they are swamped by the volume of patients uh, because of its free service it's it's given free to all citizens of the country and then the spectrum goes all the way down to the village level at community hospital and then primary health centers these are directly under the state and the central government but then there are autonomous government bodies which have their own network of hospitals like the defense the railways 
the utility companies which uh, which run their own hospitals for their own employees and then there are about a million estimated outpatient doctor clinics run by a spectrum of doctors from those qualified in the western uh, allopathic medicine as well as those who have gone through a five year course on traditional forms of medicine and at the very bottom end including a large number of quacks who operate in the villages uh, and we have a third segment which is emerging which is really home care solutions. So some very interesting work happening there where companies like Philips are offering equipment for COPD patients to manage their crisis at home which prevents them from landing up in the emergency room often. So there are those kind of uh, operations coming in or companies offering physiotherapy services at home post a surgery um, or post a knee replacement. So those are three major segments that are there in India and we can pick and choose from whether you want to skim the wealthy cream or actually approach the aspiring middle class. Sanjan, can we move on? Yes. Yeah, so one example. Yeah. yeah. So, so to take um, one example of intravenous catheters, uh, simple peripheral catheters, the estimated market size is 300 million units and about 75 million dollars worth of annual sales. Now traditionally this market was pioneered in the 1980s by western companies, uh, particularly B. Braun, uh, Beckton Dickinson and uh, these are the two main ones which came in. And they created this category, they established the concept against the wing needle sets which was traditionally then being used for infusion. Um, now this price premium as you can see from a 5 cent wing needle required an upgradation of practices to 60 cents and only the wealthy patient paying out of pocket to a therefore a wealthy hospital who could afford to buy these uh, is where the success of these products came from. Uh, the remaining population which is not being reached by these western brands uh, really still depend on the five the five cent thing needle set and though it's a declining segment. Can you click uh, Gundan? However, there is a billing uh, hidden segment which is within this latter population which we call the aspirers and they spend a 60, uh, against the 60 cent western brand they spend about a 20 cent for a domestic brand of IV catheters and these brands in the last 15-20 years have actually grown under the literally under the feet of uh, the multinational brands in the western companies which started and pioneered the category and these Indian brands have grabbed almost 80-85% by volume and 60% by value. So there is a segment among the uh, middle and lower income people who are willing to pay for a better quality. Uh, the question is to find that right sweet spot of price and quality and, and if you are able to do so there is a huge market waiting to be tapped and converted. So as we can see there is a whole spectrum of situations that you might have. On the one end you would have where you are trying to introduce a completely new concept into India where there are no practitioners, the practice is not established, for example robotic surgery and that requires a huge amount of investment in, in education and in concept selling, uh, in, in servicing and skill building. Uh, just like many many years ago J&J when they introduced minimally invasive surgery they spend a lot of effort in educating and training surgeons to adapt to this uh, form of surgery as against the open surgery that was being practiced till then. Uh, as you go down the complexity, uh, there is you might have a product category where there is a significant advancement in an existing category. And to give an example, uh, for ex uh, in the IV catheter market when Beckton Dickinson tried to introduce safety products uh, which are engineered for patient and healthcare worker safety. Uh, in this category you would have global competitors, very unlikely that you would have the low priced uh, Indian local brands and it's the same competitive domain uh, uh, set that you would have in any other part of the world. And if you have an existing and uh, significant advancement, you have an opportunity for creating volume and value share gain by upgrading the experience and outcomes. Now most companies tend to see that it's only these two situations that would warrant an entry into India with a, with a probability of success. I would like to put a, a point here that even if you have a me too product, you need to keep in mind that unlike the western Europe, uh, western markets which are fairly stagnant in terms of volume growths, 
being fully penetrated in a 0 to 1 percent population growth situation, India is growing at 12 to 15 percent by volume. So there is an opportunity to seize your share, your fair share in a growing market, which is a very different dynamic from that in the West. So, uh, j so to say here that even if you have a Me Too product, there can be opportunities to sh uh, to gain share by creating a differentiation in forms other than the product feature itself. It could be through distribution, it could be through how you market, it could be a more insightful in segmentation based on the segments that we saw earlier. Yeah. Uh, moment you talk of a very fragmented uh, healthcare delivery network of almost 40,000 hospitals uh, with an average bed size of 25 to 30 beds and accounting for 60 percent of the beds, comes the related question that how do you reach them? And today most multinational, most western companies direct sales teams where they are operating on the same go to market as exists in any other part of the world are able to reach only the top tier hospitals, the global class and the, and the next five, six hundred hospitals, which accounts for maybe 15 percent of the beds. All the other hospitals are really sourcing their stocks through mom and pop regional distributors who in turn sell to a network of mom and pop pharmacies uh, and they estimated half a million pharmacies in the country. And it's through these pharmacies that the GP clinic uh, or indeed the 15, 20, 25 bedded hospital is actually buying most of their goods from. Very, I don't think there's a single case where a company has been able to afford a large enough sales team to call on all these hospitals directly. However, these distributors uh, claim, some of them claim to be national, but they're essentially people with stronger finances and the ability to handle import license and interface with their principal in Europe or US and import the stocks into the country. But once they get the stocks in, they really work through a network of sub-distributors, which is a loose relationships between them. Uh, and they're not really taking ownership of promoting and creating demand. And they are box pushers, they are wholesalers, and have limited value-added selling capabilities. And many of them, and most of them, in fact, are multi-brand. And it's clear, it's clear to everybody that if your distributor sells your competitor's products, they're less inclined to promote or push yours because for him it will only be converting one brand to another without his total sales going up. Uh, some of the concerns are dealing with a distributor and this is, about, this is an important point for many companies which may not have a legal entity yet in India and are selling primarily through a national importer distributor. The concerns are increasingly around FCPA compliance. Uh, like I said, many of these distributors are wholesaler oriented, they have their traditional ways of working and oftentimes it's with uh, disproportionate high markups which raises the red flag of uh, un un unethical practices in how they get the business. So they being of, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act which prevents, yeah, which outlaws American companies from paying bribes anywhere in the world. And that's similar, there are similar laws like the UK Bribery Act and so on uh, which are increasingly becoming important and, um, and those are risks to watch out again when you're dealing with a distributor who expects you to be a hands-off uh, and after you have sold your stocks to him and leave the rest to him. Uh, there needs to be a little bit of caution in, in operating in that manner. Uh, these distributors don't want to have transparency in pricing and margins. They're, they're reluctant to share all those details with you and that often leads to cross-channel conflict because the discipline uh, of working in a defined geography or a defined set of accounts is often broken. Uh, by, by when you have many, many suppliers who are competing for the same pie of business. Okay, before we go to the next slide, perhaps we can do one more poll, Rajneesh, if that's okay. Yeah. All right. So let's find out about the markets that are important to our clients or our attendees. can take a moment to, to tell us which are the most important markets for you at this point, India, China, Brazil, or someone else. I'd like to encourage everyone to please send us any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close the poll.
here the result. So we have quite a wide distribution here between India, China, and Brazil. Uh, so we have we have a very diverse audience. And so let me run one more poll if I, if I could. Let's understand a little bit about how you are doing in India. Uh, since so many of you are looking at India as not the primary focus this year. Tell us if you are considering the, the idea of selling to India, you have limited sales, or it's an important part of your sales, or you already have a subsidiary or a JV. Yeah, are we getting some questions yet? Uh, we have a couple, but we do have a very quiet audience. So I would like to encourage everyone, please uh, go ahead and send us questions. It's a great opportunity for you to get any questions you might have answered by um, two very experienced uh, uh, individuals. Thank you. Yeah, friends, we don't we don't play pre-recorded webinars as some companies do. Each each one is is like a jazz performance. It's <laughs> tailored to the audience. So uh, please take advantage of this and, and share with us what are, whatever are your concerns. Uh, your answers to the polls are confidential and we don't share your last name on uh, when, we, when you give us a question. So your answers are not, uh, other people don't know what you're asking about. Okay, so we have 56% of the people saying that they're considering the idea and 22% have limited sales. You haven't shared the results, Sunjan. Oh, I haven't shared them. Sorry. Here. Now everybody can see them. 56% are saying that they are considering the idea. 22% have limited sales. And only about 10% have a subsidiary in India. And then there's probably some service providers or consultants also attending, which is fine. Alrighty. So we'll tailor the answers to any questions based on this information. Let me get back to the slide. Yeah. Rajneesh can continue. Yeah. So uh, in this kind of a scenario, um, for, and as the Kunjan's poll just indicated, that many of you are not in or not in India yet, and some of you are India in India in a limited way. I guess uh, for a company which thinks of starting into India there are two really viable options that have traditionally been there. Either you go the whole way and set up a full-fledged legal entity or a joint venture. And obviously for many companies that doesn't make sense to start with when you have almost nil sales. And the logical option seems to be the second one which is to appoint a national distributor as, is, as what works in many other countries who will import and then make it available to many of the customers in India. Uh, as we mentioned in, some, in the previous slide, that there are some challenges of working through the distributor. Primarily that, that culture of organized, marketing-led, demand-generating distributor doesn't exist. That, that base of distributors doesn't exist. And most of the distributors are multi-brand wholesalers. Uh, and the issues around FCPA, etc. We would recommend a, a creative solution that is to have a distributor which you need to physically take title to goods and make it available in the country. Uh, but to combine it with a strategic partner, which could be uh, almost like an outsourced sales and marketing department for you on a variable basis, it makes available to you a range of capabilities from high-end country manager kind of strategic capability, but on a variable cost basis based on time. And, and deliverables, uh, as well as all the way down to hiring a, a local sales team which can then call on clinicians to generate the demand, and manage and supervise and have line of sight on the way a distributor works. So that's really the proposition, uh, which will then add value and provides a middle ground between those two extremes of having only a distributor, which then is a hands-off kind of approach, and the other extreme of having your own full-fledged legal entity and your own country manager in there. Uh, so apart from managing the sales and marketing, what uh, an Amrit kind of solution could also offer is to engage with the government bureaucrats in an advocacy effort to shape policy wherever that might be relevant. As you saw in Sepit's case, 
they are working in the national program on tuberculosis control and are trying to bring in new technologies and shaping policy there and to bring in a whole multi-stakeholder public-private partnerships. So that's a, a proposition which uh, gives you the alternative to when you're not ready to yet set up a legal entity in the country. Perfect. Thanks so much, uh, Rajneesh. Uh, and if I were to summarize the last few slides that Rajneesh ran through, I think you can see that he's a master of subtle, creative, subtle market segmentation. As we look at Amrit clients and their success in many, many different practices, we find that this is a common thread. Being able to understand the nuances of the Indian market and being able to segment the market appropriately often tells the difference between runaway success and a lukewarm kind of reaction to the, to the Indian market. So uh, we've spent a lot of time on, on segmentation, but we've done so for a very important reason because we think that it's, uh, it's one of the key markers of success as you enter the Indian market, which is so different from China and other markets. So Priya, do we have questions that we can take about market yeah. entry at this point before uh, we get into the R&D section? Yes. Uh, so um, we have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, let me see which one will fit in right now. We have a question from Todd who would like to know more about the feasibility of doing clinical trials in India in addition to sales in that market. So I assume that the clinical trials are for global needs rather than for product being sold in India because there's been a lot of activity on that front over the last many years. Now in the last year, uh, so as you can imagine when Western companies are funding clinical trials in a poor economy like India, there's always the worry and risk that, uh, that there may be uh, inappropriate things happening to very poor people who are going to this just for the money and are not being taken care of well. So the Indian government has set up many precautions and processes to explain, you know, a requirement to explain to the patients in their regional language, you know, what, what, is, uh, what is going to happen, what are the risks, what are the roles uh, that, that, that they need to play. There's limitations on, you know, repeat participation by any, by any subject and, and a number of other rules. Last year there was a little bit of a hiccup in this whole process because uh, because of which clinical trials came to a slowdown, if not a stop. Uh, Rajneesh, do you have some insight on whether that has that has uh, resolved itself by now? No, I don't think I have a, a, a correct up, a update on that. Okay, Todd, we would have to get back to you. I saw some news that uh, forward movement was starting to happen again. Uh, there was a large volume of clinical trials going on in India and many of the Western companies had set up subsidiaries there. There are many Indian companies offering it as well. Uh, some of our clients who are on the edges of, you know, the, not, not in the pharmaceutical business, but the related healthcare businesses have conducted trials last year. I was in India twice for, for one of our clients in the early part of the year, but this wasn't for a pharmaceutical or a device kind of product. So we'll, we'll get back to you. I, I have a feeling that um, the, the full volume has not definitely not started yet. But the capabilities are there and it's just a, a bureaucratic matter to get these things cleared up. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, so we have a question from Tom who is interested in knowing the length of the approval process to potentially distribute in India and uh, what it entails along with, you know, types of certificates, licenses, um, costs. I assume he's asking about the time it takes to get the regulatory approval, not the dis not the time it takes to find a distributor and, and get that going. Rajneesh, would you like to take that question? Yeah, so um, there are a set of categories of products which are which are listed, which require an import license and registration. Uh, if you happen to be in that, then there's a certain process to be followed, which takes about uh, nine to ten months to get the registration certificate and post the registration certificate uh, another couple of months on the upside, upper side for getting the import license. Once the import license is issued in the name of the importer, uh, he is free to then go ahead and start importing and stocking and, and, and selling. 
uh, if you are not falling, if your product does not fall into that listed um, into that list of products, then you are free to import without any uh, restriction, and then you can get started as soon as you have a, a party in India who is willing to buy and import. Excellent. Which may be just a couple of months to find such a party. Perfect. Thanks so much, Rajneesh. So let's uh, let's hold off on the other questions until we are done with the webinar. Sure. And I'm going to switch to the idea of using uh, using Indian engineers uh, to uh, to be able to design product. So there are many companies that have the so-called captive engineering centers, which means that the employees in India actually work for the Western company. And, and there's plenty of uh, material about these. I actually wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review uh, in, uh, that appeared in early December talking about captive uh, R&D centers in general. It wasn't specific to med MedTech, uh, but we'd be happy to send that to anyone who's interested. And uh, I'm in the process of writing a follow-on article to, the, uh, to that that will probably appear sometime next month. So here you have an example of the lullaby baby warmer designed by the a uh, Jack Welch uh, uh, R&D center in Bangalore. It was designed for India, in India, uh, but it turned out that they could sell this product overseas as well, and it has done reasonably, reasonably well uh, from whatever uh, uh, PR we've seen from GE. There are many other examples like this. Uh, we just chose uh, the, the uh, baby warmer. Uh, Siemens has a, has a nice history of uh, these kinds of uh, innovations as well. So if you look at the product development life cycle, uh, starting from the investigation and going all the way down to test and verification and any iterations thereof, uh, early on people used to think that uh, only the things that relate to test verification, perhaps detailed design and development, are the ones that you could send offshore. And the so-called front-end tasks such as investigation, concept, and the early design could not really be outsourced or offshored. Well, the experience of Amrit and its clients is, is, is different. What, we, what we've done for many of our clients is we look at their existing pipeline of product development, and we divide it up into various projects or initiatives, and for each of them we look and see whether it makes sense to uh, take an appropriate piece of the product development life cycle and move it offshore. And we've had many examples where the early investigation could be done offshore. We've had examples where the concept and the industrial design as well as the functionality design has been done offshore. Clearly there's more density in terms of the development and test and verification, but we encourage our clients not to limit themselves to, the, uh, to those tasks alone. Uh, because A, it sets up your Indian engineers to feel that they are at the bottom of the totem pole and that doesn't lead to a high degree of retention. And B, it, uh, it doesn't permit you to use the full uh, spectrum of Indian talent available. Now, it's not an easy thing to make this happen. And I don't want to minimize uh, uh, by showing you this simple chart uh, as if you could just fill out a set of checkboxes and do it. But I can tell you that the companies that have taken this path have found it themselves far more successful and have actually converted their engineering expertise in India and other countries to become a competitive advantage, not just a, a place where they get done, low cost work done. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of case studies uh, that I can walk you through very quickly. Uh, here the idea for this particular client was that there's their US team was being overworked, and they were having to do a lot of things that, that they felt could be sent offshore. So they did choose a captive model. Initially, this was driven by cost reduction, but also they felt that they needed to establish a brand presence in India because they were looking at, this was a few years ago, and they were looking at expanding their presence in India. They, Marketing was beating up several of their business divisions on taking too long to get product to market. And so they felt that if they could add to the headcount, that they would be able to do products and projects much faster. Uh, they had a small presence in Japan. So in our analysis, we looked at whether that should be expanded. And then we looked at options in 
China as well as India. Uh, much of the effort after the early work was devoted to looking at three cities in India for them. And finally, we established an R&D center. I'm not going to reveal what city it was in. It was in one of the cities that are listed here. Uh, but we also found that there was an important element of outsourcing so that they had a hybrid model uh, once they were going steady state, where some of the work was being done by their own engineers offshore, and some of it uh, could be done by outsourced partners. This is not unusual uh, for, uh, for many companies. If you look at my, my companies outside of MedTech, such as Cisco or Microsoft, uh, they followed this kind of model as well. But it's a specific uh, graduated process to get to this point. Let me skip, in the interest of time, let me skip through the, the other slide here and give you a more of a structure of how uh, these uh, various options compare to each other. So on the x-axis, we have the investment by the company in terms of time and cost. And on the y-axis, you have the leverage that you derive by using innovation in country. So the, the, uh, the bottom left, you have a straight outsourced agreement with a service provider. This doesn't take much investment from you, but it also gives you a smaller return because first, first of all, the outsourced provider has to make their profit, and second of all, they may not be as invested in, in delivering innovative solutions that your own team can do. At the other extreme, you have the cap captive R&D center, which we've talked about already. And with Amrit's help, again, segmenting this, there's a couple of middle ground solutions that we can find that you could have a collaborative relationship with a company in India that is not necessarily a service provider, but uh, maybe in a related business, they don't see you as a direct competitive threat, and they can do some of the, uh, some of the work in collaboration with you. Maybe you share the IP with them in some manner. They get some value. You get some value. We've set up a number of these relationships that have worked very well uh, with a much lower commitment in terms of headcount than either the service agreement with the provider or even the captive R&D center. And sometimes this can be the main way in which you enter India for tech talent, and sometimes it can be supplementary. And obviously, you can also have a contact contract relationship with the research organization. We won't dwell very much on that. So for those who are engaging in India, one of the questions I ask is, are you simply looking at India as a place to do engineering, or also, are you also looking at India as a place where you can innovate, whether it's for the domestic market or the global market. The obvious place where people want to start with innovation in India is through software. Uh, so a lot of mobile applications for med, med device companies are being done in India. A lot of integration into back-end systems uh, between mobile devices and ERP and uh, between, uh, between uh, uh, mobile devices and other aspects of your, uh, of your operations. Uh, but you can go beyond that, and one of the themes that we have espoused for the last eight or nine years is this idea of frugal innovation, where you uh, can leverage the Indian mindset to be very frugal with resources, whether it's, the, it's time, whether it is the material or cost, and come up with a solution that you might not even have thought about in a Western context. This is happening inside the R&D centers of many of our clients and many companies who are not our clients. It's also happening in the startup ecosystem. Many Western VCs now have set up operations in India, and some of them are starting to fund medtech startups. A few of those startups are servicing the Indian market. A few of them are using India as a base to serve global markets. So there's a lot of activity here, and we do encourage our, our clients from Europe and America to keep this in mind as they look at India. Some people aren't quite ready for this, but I think um, the, the business case is well proven that you should be looking at this. You might be leaving money on the table if you don't. So we come to the end of our formal presentation, and I would, I would encourage those of you who want to pursue this further to send us an email at usa at amrit.com. We can send you the article that Rajneesh and I wrote for MedDev Insights that just appeared last month. 
in addition to another article that appeared a few few months earlier. Uh, Supriya referred to my article for HBR on how U.S. businesses can succeed in India in 2015, and that's not specific to medtech companies, but I think it has value for many of you in the audience. Uh, if you have questions that are specific to your needs, uh, where you'd like to uh, disclose something to us in terms of uh, wanting help, uh, we can certainly uh, take that offline. This is, again, not a sales webinar, so we are not going to dwell on that any further. Uh, Supriya, do we have questions? Uh, yes, uh, Gunjan, we actually have two similar questions from two different people, so I'm going to kind of uh, uh, combine them. We have a question from Balaji who's asking, um, what is the average compensation of mid-high-level medical device engineers, managers in India? And then we have a question from Clarissa who's asking, do you help with hiring and what is your advice to hire the right people in India? Okay, let me give you the initial answer and then Rajneesh may want to embellish that further. So the, the ramp of salaries versus experience in India is much steeper than we see in the United States or in Western countries. So someone who is uh, at a very senior level in India uh, might be making a salary not not incomparable with uh, you know uh, with, with with a Western salary. So uh, people who have you know 500,000 people reporting to them, uh, whether they are in India or the U.S., might be at very comparable levels. Whereas if you have somebody who's fresh out of college uh, in India versus in the United States, the difference can be very substantial. Uh, the Indian salaries are far far lower. Uh, I won't get into specific numbers right now because it, it really depends on the kind of skill that you, you want to utilize and the, uh, the level of experience and, 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 and what, whether they work for a Western company before or not and so on. Uh, the, the old rule of thumb they used to say was uh, three to one between U.S. and Indian salaries. Uh, that's probably at the low end. Uh, you know, and, and I'm not sure that I subscribe to that because we've seen instances in certain areas where it can be as much as 10 to 1, where the Indian Indian equivalent employee could make as little as a tenth, and there are other cases where it's it's a 2 to 1. So uh, I don't really like to go by averages. We really have to look at a specific job position and determine uh, the location and, and, and so on. Uh, there's a big range between salaries in Mumbai versus salaries in a second tier town. Uh, to the second question, do we help? Yes. Our mission at Amrit is to help American and European companies become successful in India, whatever it takes. So one of the key markers of success is having the right people on board. And this can consist of two separate components. One is uh, many Western companies will say, we'll, we want to send someone from the US or Europe to India, or we want them running part of the business from Europe or India or Singapore or Dubai or Shanghai, whatever. So we help our clients determine what is the right mindset, what's the right personality, who is the right person to be able to perform that function from the people that they already have on board. Very often, the answer is not necessarily someone of Indian origin, although there are many, many instances of people of Indian origin who are successful in this, there are equally that many instances of people who had no exposure to India, but as long as they are humble and willing to learn and willing to adapt, and if, if they are married, if, if their spouse is also willing to deal with the challenges of uh, dealing with uh, life in India, that they can be tremendously successful. In my book, Doing Business in 21st Century India, which came out a few years ago, I interviewed over 100 American executives living in India, and I found more than half of them doing extremely well in India and, and wishing to extend their, their stay there. Some of them have even retired in India after, after the, completing their, their period of work. So, uh, so uh, that's one component, which is taking your own staff and figuring out who's going to be involved. The second component is hiring people uh, within India. And typically, we get involved in, first of all, helping define the kind of roles and the senior positions, and second of all, for the first five or ten top hires, we can be very actively involved in conducting interviews, in sourcing candidates, in participating in the decision making, uh, determining the way the compensation should be structured. Uh, we performed all of those functions for our Western clients. 
uh, this saves them time because they don't have to travel to India half a dozen times or fly candidates from India uh, to their uh, Western offices. It also allows us to convey some of the nuances of what it takes to succeed in India. Just because someone worked for a Western company doesn't mean that they are the best candidate. After all, they'll be selling in India. And so you want to be sure that they understand the Indian marketplace. And the same thing about people running an R&D center. You want to be sure that they can motivate and lead Indian engineers at the same time as they are communicating to their Western counterparts. So these are tough positions to fill. And there are many people who are very, very competent uh, in other ways but can't perform this role. That's one of the key functions that we offer. Sorry for the long answer, Rajneesh. Do you want to add something for, to that? Yeah, it may not be directly related to the question, but I think the point which I would leave is, uh, you know, very, very often companies are, which are trying to hire a country manager in the country uh, face the dilemma that uh, if you do you hire for the here and now uh, kind of role or do you hire for the long term? Because the difference could be a difference of uh, $100,000 versus uh, two hundred fifty to $300,000 in terms of CTC. Uh, the hiring for now would be basically essentially a sales manager uh, who can handle a national sales team because in the first 12 to 24 months, the key priority would be to get a sales team in place uh, supported by a regulatory and a finance person at a, at a certain level. But essentially the role is that of a national sales head uh, with a country manager designation. But the person may lack the strategic capability to parallelly think through the next engine of growth after that 18 to 24 month period is over. And that's where I think the model that we suggested could fill in that you hire for the here and now and the strategic bandwidth could be made available through an organization like Amrit on a variable basis without you having to hire a full time person. Uh, what that person would bring, the, the strategic person would also bring is the ability to translate uh, what, uh, um, you know, and be the link, communication link also between the parent company's head office and the local person on the ground. Okay, great. Thanks. I know we are running over, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stay on for, for uh, uh, as long as there are questions, but uh, so Priya, for those who want to leave, can you can you uh, do the conclusion and then we'll yes, stay on after yes. that? Sounds good. Um, thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. We hope it was informative. If you have any additional questions, please go ahead and email us at usa at amrit.com. Again, that's usa at amrit.com. Uh, please make sure as you're exiting the webinar that you answer a brief survey that is presented to you. We would really appreciate your feedback on the session today. If you have any friends or colleagues who would think you might, might benefit from a similar webinar, please have them register on our website, www.amrit.com, and we will notify them of any upcoming webinars. Thank you so much for attending today, and have a nice day. All right, Supriya. Let's okay, so I think we have actually one last question um, that uh, Jason is asking. Um, do clinicians um, have the major say in determining the selection of brands? or is it the procurement function that determines the choice of brand? Rajneesh, would you like to take that? Okay. Um, well, traditionally and to a very large extent, it is still the clinician who has a strong say. Um, obviously, products which are used by the clinician by his own hands uh, would tend to be more uh, of, uh, on that basis, whereas products which are seen to be uh, for example, a, a normal syringe or a glove, uh, where the clinician involvement has been much lower, they would be happy to leave the decision to the purchase and procurement function. Having said that, in the very top end of the market, the very top tier hospitals, the corporate for-profit hospitals, things are beginning to change very rapidly, where the procurement function is much more empowered by their managements to create a formulary of brands basis price negotiation among the brands which have been deemed to be uh, above the required quality and, and meeting all the specifications which the clinicians drive. So clinicians would still set the specifications but would be prevented from then choosing the brand itself which the, which the procurement function is beginning to take on to itself. Uh, that is becoming a big change and the implication for that is that the 50 year old 
a global model for most companies, which is to have a highly trained salesperson who goes inside the OP or the ICU or the ward and talks to the nursing and the clinicians and the doctors and convinces them on clinical data, that road is suddenly being uh, you know, met with a dead end. And the clinicians are turning around to the sales guy and saying, look, I'm convinced, but the procurement is not letting your brand in, so what can I do? And that is catching a lot of companies unawares and catching them on the wrong foot because companies have not really built an equivalent amount of health economic data. They have a lot of clinical data on their efficacy, but not the health economic data. And that's requiring companies to really rethink on how they would really market to that kind of top tier hospitals. I would still say it's maybe only two or three or four percent of the volumes which are moving in that direction at the very top end, but it's something which could percolate down very rapidly in the next five to ten years. Perfect. Thanks, Rajneesh. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you, Gunjan and uh, Rajneesh, for your uh, participation in our session today. And uh, Gunjan, any last words? Uh, well, I think Rajneesh and I have both really enjoyed this interactive session. I would encourage <coughs> anybody on the phone who has uh, more questions to email us, and we'll, we can take them offline. Uh, we will be sending you uh, the slide set and a recording of the webinar. Some of you have already requested uh, copies of the article and or the articles, and we will uh, comply with those as well. Uh, so uh, you should get them in the next couple of days. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining today, and uh, we look forward to interacting with you in the future. Have a good day. Thank you.